It's uh, 45 years since I first came to New York. At that time, I was working for BP, and I'd spent two years in Alaska as a petroleum engineer. Uh, I was sent here in New York to New York because, for the simple reason, that it was closer to London. And that, of course, was before the internet and real travel. It was a dream posting, and it made a lasting impression on my life. It was in New York in the early 70s that I first became, I came to understand what it meant for business to be socially responsible. When I arrived here in 1971, BP was still waiting for approval to build the Trans-Alaska pipeline that would move oil from its discovery at Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to market. There were myriad technical challenges, which the company had overcome with the then state-of-the-art engineering. But what it had done is it had failed entirely to account for the concerns of the Alaskan people and the environmental groups who also had an interest in the area. The Alaska Federation of Natives wanted compensation in return for the pipeline passing through their lands. NGOs such as the Environmental Defense Fund wanted greater certainty that the fragile tundra would not be damaged. As a result, the pipeline permit was refused by the Department of the Interior, and it took five more years for the differences to be resolved and the permit to be granted. So in the interim, my workload in New York became incredibly light. Not that I complained. I took up other activities, such as learning about food, and I developed an interest in art and photography which lasts to this day. But I saw firsthand how a failure to engage with society can have a tangible negative impact on business. The delay in construction changed the economics of the project dramatically. Originally forecast to cost $900 million, uh, the pipeline ended up costing $8 billion, or in today's money, $32 billion. In New York during the 70s, I was just a, a junior observer. It was only after studying at the Stanford Graduate School of Business under the great George Leyland Bach in the 1980s that I was really able to see how important it was to, to look at business problems in a very wide context. I began to understand the need for multiple stakeholders, from companies to communities, governments and campaigners, to work together. I began to make sense of some of my time in Alaska and in New York. And that experience permanently altered the way I thought about and wanted to do business. That came to a head again in Stanford in 1997, many years later. I made a speech there arguing that the link between climate change and fossil fuel emissions could no longer be ignored. I was the first CEO to do that. I challenged BP and the wider oil and gas industry to be part of a solution. Specifically, I committed my company to do five things, to reduce greenhouse gases, to fund research and development, to work with developing countries to reduce their carbon emissions, to develop alternative fuels, and most importantly, to contribute to the public policy debate on climate change. It might have been a bold thing to do, but it wasn't reckless. The commitments were decided after a lot of consultation with our own scientific uh, advisors and external experts, and we worked hard to win the support of those both inside the company and outside. At the time, I don't think I saw it as being bold. It was only after years of reflection that I came to think of it as such. In the moment, such decisions come down to one thing, clarity of purpose. You may well end up burning a bridge behind you, as we did temporarily with other members of the oil and gas industry. We were accused by the lobby group who represents the oil industry of having left the church, whatever that meant. Their chief executives came to see me to check 
whether I was okay and whether I was actually still thinking in the right way. Uh, but almost 20 years later, uh, and this has been announced, I think, today, all major oil companies acknowledge the danger posed by climate change, and they have announced that a group of seven European and Middle Eastern oil and gas companies, including BP, were joined to forces to fund the development of new renewable energies technologies. Progress on this is great. It might seem as if it's glacial, but uh, the initiative announced today has the potential to help reconnect the oil and gas industry with the rest of society. It's got to be followed through, uh, and we need to watch very carefully that these companies actually do what they've committed to do. History is littered with examples of companies that have lost sight of their core purpose. Researching my latest book called Connect, we found corporate scandals spanning the last 2,000 years that, in my view, can be attributed to companies failing to act in the interests of society. And what's worse is these scandals are cyclical. Once the public outcry has subsided, businesses forget or ignore the lessons learned. For example, Wells Fargo. It's not yet 10 years since the financial crisis was triggered, in part by unserviceable mortgages being issued by frontline staff to meet targets. And yet last month, that bank was found to have incentivized its employees to open accounts that customers didn't know about. Two million dollars in fees charged on the fake accounts may appear relatively small, but it is indicative of yet another company that had lost touch with reality. The fact that business keeps repeating mistakes should be a source of embarrassment and stimulus enough to cause reform. Leaders seem to recognize this, but are struggling to change the nature of their relationship with society. So in a, we did a very big survey of 2,000 CEOs, and I found that they, they said that they spend a third of their time cultivating their relationship with society. But yet fewer than 30% of them thought they did that successfully. They're right to spend so much time on this because the value they have at risk is huge. On average, a company's relationship with society is worth about 30% of corporate earnings, and that's on average. In the most catastrophic cases, from the East India Company of the past to Enron of the recent past, the value of an entire company can be destroyed. There's also a significant upside in getting stakeholder engagement right. All the research indicates that the most inclusive companies make the most amount of money. In fact, one study found that such companies outperformed their competitors by an average of 2% every year for a decade. So the value at risk and returns available are now generally accepted. But a new approach is needed to leading uh, the relationship with society. And I believe this co calls for bold and radical engagement and three things should be thought about. First, leaders must constantly monitor the world around them, looking out for any changes in the context in which they operate, including how their staff and their teams are changing. And this means understanding the risk posed not only by external stakeholders, but also understanding the risks their business might pose to society itself. For BP in 1997, this meant surveying the developments of research and the changing attitudes towards climate change of customers and using that information to inform decision making. Second, they need to integrate their relationship with society into their core activity. Now, too often, it's considered as something separate. Leaders need to ensure that all decisions are made, all decisions are made, with society in mind,
by those at the heart of the business, not simply at the fringe of the business doing good works. Radically thinking about how a business can engage with society can create value in very unexpected ways. At BP, for example, we hit our emissions targets, which we set in 97, uh, nine years ahead of schedule, generating hundreds of millions of dollars of value in the process. And finally, and I think most importantly, leaders need to be inclusive, inclusive in all their dealings with society. And it needs to be a deep inclusion. This means addressing society's concerns, not according to a corporate agenda, but on the terms of the affected stakeholders. After the speech at Stanford, I got the company to lean in to the problem. We invited leading environmental NGOs to help us think about how we could deliver on our commitments. And they'd fought us on lots of projects, such as the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, but they could see that we were sincere in what we were trying to do and accepted the invitation. I inclusion sounds very simple, but in fact it goes against an inherent corporate preference for tight control over decision making. But companies will never make peace with society as long as they treat stakeholders with the suspicion traditionally reserved for enemies. There is a sincere but frustrated desire to connect successfully with society. Leaders recognize the value, but they can't quite seem to get it right. To overcome this, leaders need to turn their recognition of the challenges into strategies for engagement that go to the heart of the company's commercial purpose. They need to think not only about uh, themselves. They need new strategies for engagement, not just at the company level, but also for themselves. So, for example, I took a bold decision about climate change. What I did, however, was fail to take another decision about myself. I failed to come out as gay. I came out only when I was outed. And for today, the leaders of today need to recognize that there is no difference between their personal life and the way in which they lead a company. It's essential to be yourself and to be authentic in everything that you do. And who knows, if I'd been bolder and come out as gay maybe five years before I did, all sorts of other things might have happened. But I am confident that if leaders recognize this, business itself will, be, will continue to be an enormous economic force for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my prepared remarks. I think I get to have a conversation now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, and thank you for the privilege to all of us of having a conversation with you. Um, let's, let's start with the, um, the 1997 moment, uh, because clearly that was a defining moment. It was defining for you as a business leader, as a person, but also for BP as a company. I, I couldn't help noticing that you said that you did not conceive of the decision to make the speech and recognize the importance of climate change as being a bold, um, bold decision to make. How was that? Well, curiously, I, I think I regarded it at the time as simply the next step to take. To be a part of the world and to provide energy, you couldn't provide energy and in the meanwhile uh, do something which will hurt humanity. I'd, I'd realized at that moment that uh, the purpose of reducing climate change was not to save the world. The world will, the earth will take care of itself. You know, it really is a very big place, big system. What it was about was to try and save people dying. Uh, it was about people. And we were in the business of creating products to make people's life better. You know, they could 
have mobility, they could have heat, they could have light. And so how come we were doing that at the same time as we were ignoring the potential, the actual downside? We had to do something about it. Otherwise, we looked like a one-eyed monster. Mm -hmm. You know, there were two things to think about. And so uh, I spoke to, uh, actually the reason I did this in, in Stanford was uh, I'd been the chairman of the business school and Mike Spence, a great Nobel laureate, uh, was uh, the dean. And he said, well, I think you should do it here because it's a pretty obvious thing that we should do. We should carry on and, and do it. So I did it and uh, I actually didn't think anything about it. I just said, this is what we're going to do. And we started doing it. And the reaction was very negative. And I think as I heard, as, as you talked about this, the, the, the thing that occurs to me is this is, a, this is a dilemma that a lot of business leaders will face. That on the one hand, they as business leaders recognize the fundamental changes that are taking place and how that will harm business in the very long term, yet at the same time, they as business leaders are, of course, measured by their short-term performance. What was the calculus that you made there in terms of yes, we need to do this on the long term, but this may actually have, may have negative impacts in the short term. So I, I think first it's, you know, for leaders, one of the things, and I still find it today, and in all the things I've done, it's a really important discipline, is that legacy, what's happened in the past, can bind you into what happens into the future. In other words, you've made a series of decisions, or you've actually made some investments, and they haven't gone right, they've gone wrong, and you don't say, wait a minute, now stop, Actually, these things are wrong. Uh, you know, they're, they're, there may be mistakes, they may be simply bad judgments, or I may not have recognized what to do because the circumstances were different. Well, I can talk about that with my personal life about coming out as gay. But first, you've got to release yourself from the legacy, otherwise you don't make any changes. Mm. Uh, and secondly, you have to believe that the future, and I think you can underpin it today with analysis, that the future actually will be better for your company by making these decisions. So, for example, it is clear, it is very, very clear, that companies that take engagement, which in order to get engagement, you have to get inclusion right, companies that take engagement very seriously, and that means not just with their internal teams, but outside, clearly make more money than people who don't. It is obvious. And secondly, when things go wrong, if you invest in leaning into what society really wants you to do, people aren't stupid. I mean, they're telling you the whole time if you listen. If you lean into it, you will reduce the value at risk when something inevitably goes wrong with your company. Mm. You know, no company, I mean, the problem with corporations very often is that they project themselves as perfect. Uh, you know, all press releases turn failures into success. Uh, everything is perfect. No one admits a mistake. Very inhuman, because it's just not true. I mean, companies make mistakes. So they need to prepare for those days when things go wrong. And by investing in engagement, you prepare for it. You build a reservoir of trust that you can rely upon and deplete a bit. One of the themes that we often touch on in, in this setting is whether to act individually or whether to act collectively. And you must have had that calculus when you made the decision to go out as BP as opposed to go out with the industry. Did you have those prior conversations and, and what do you, do you think that at times in order to see the disruption that's necessary someone has to make that very bold decision and that can be more effective than if you bring an entire industry with you? Most definitely. I mean, you can't tie your hands down eventually with people who are not part of your institutional structure, in other words, you're not actually leading them, uh, that are doing something which you fundamentally disagree with. Mm -hmm. uh, you try and work it, so we did. So BP was part of a coalition of all these people talking about climate change and we realized very quickly that, you know, we were talking to the air. Uh, there was nothing, uh, there was no one to receive what, no one listened to us. Uh, and so we said, well, we've tried, you know, we've given everyone warning, say, we're going to do something about this. And they said, oh, no, you won't, you know, because we'll, we'll s smother you with our ideas. And uh, so we did. 
mm. uh, because in the end you, you, you can't do it. You can't, uh, you know, can't conspire with people or join with people with whom you have a fundamental disagreement as long as it is honestly and authentically held and you really believe it and you can do something about it. And BP could do something about it and did. I just want to say that we will soon take questions, um, so please send those via, you can send those via Twitter, and we'll of course also open up for questions from the floor, so hashtag BSR16. Um, another theme is, is, is this about, so you clearly set the tone from the top, but you also had a very large organization behind you that where not everyone thought the same way as you did, and you had a lot of skeptics, and you, you talked about that. How, how does one prepare an organization for making very bold moves? How do you do that? So I, I think uh, you know, it is, it is if, if you really get everyone behind you, then you probably haven't listened. Mm. Uh, because great companies are filled with great people, all of whom have in, individual ways of looking at problems and opinions. But equally, very great people, in the end, when they recognize that the the basics of the company require them to go in one direction, they go in that direction. So you need to get to the point where both for the rational explanation, i.e., you know, we can make more money, this sort of thing, and for the irrational, which is the emotional, which is it's the right thing to do, and we may actually be able to recruit better people because uh, they might also agree with us and they might disagree with other people then uh, you have to get these two tracks working. And different people uh, think differently. Some people will just look at the maths and say, fine, you know, we're going to get an EPS pickup and we're going to do it for this reason. And that's very good. Other people are going to say, we're going to do it because I know I can recruit 20 better people from Stanford or Cambridge uh, to join the company, and that'll make a big difference in the future. And some people will just say, actually, you know, my children have told me that you're a bad person working for a fossil fuel company, and it's time we did something about it. And so they'll respond to all kinds of inputs. So I think you've just got to recognize that, and it's like building any coalition. Coalition is built not sometimes on the basis of the problem being solved, but on the, a broader sense of getting a change made. So to the point about coalition building and, and inclusion, um, do you think the time has come for a different type of governance in the private sector? Um, I, I'm always very reluctant to talk about this because it very quickly gets into the point of having, well, let's have unified governance and therefore the conclusion is we must have world governance, which means that we can get great things done for the world. It's impossible, of course. Uh, and we should not embark, I think, down a path like that. What was quite good was COP21, for example, was terrific because the, the principal negotiators understood that the coalition uh, was built on loose governance, loose governance, which meant you weren't confronting people with, to make a decision they weren't quite ready for. So I think that's terrific. My own view is that uh, there are enough inputs to, into corporations at the moment to get them to change. I do think that uh, it's very important that corporations be required to be as transparent as we want them, uh, as they need to be, as they must be, uh, without uh, creating a language that is impossible for people to understand. I think the the language of corporate communications can get quite esoteric from time to time because people are trying to maybe avoid exactly what they want to say with clarity. One of the, uh, one of the experiences that we have made is in the process of seeking to engage stakeholders and help companies listen more and lean in towards society. The response that's coming back is very frequently, yes, we'd like to be listened to, but we actually also want to be part of the decision making. And, and, and sort of, do, do you see that there might be hybrid models whereby, I mean, we have it in certain European countries where we have trade unions that are part of the board of directors. Um, do you see that there might be other models underway? I, I, I think it's very different. I think, again, this is the definition of radical engagement. I think you have to go out and listen to people's agenda and then start the discussion on their agenda. 
What you can't do is you can say, you cannot go out, I believe, today, and it's, we've seen this again and again, even in the political sphere, in the discussion of Brexit, and you cannot go out and say, I'm an expert, this is the answer, mm. I have the plan. People say, well, I don't believe you. You know, why should I believe you? Let's build the problem up, the solution up together. Here's my concern. And you may f suddenly find out that your concern and their concern bear no relationship one to the other. And you've got to, I think, do that. I, I think, um, you know, I've been, I've been on the board of a very big uh, German company. I've been on supervisory boards of Daimler-Benz and uh, BP Germany. I'm chairman of a supervisory board at the moment. And I much respect co-determination. But co-determination labor representatives on the supervisory board also has negative impacts. It means that much of the decision making is delegated, plus perhaps too much, to the Vorstand, to the management board below, because many things cannot be discussed at the supervisory board. And I think that, that so there's always a, a trade-off in governance uh, that you've got to think through. Uh, I think it's having great directors. In the end, you know, all governance systems don't substitute for weak directors. I think directors of companies should be tested and they should be looked at and said, are they actually doing a good job? And if not, they should be asked to go. And the same is true with CEOs and, and the C-suite. But they, they have to be people who recognize uh, that, that being a company, doing business, is, is a great privilege. Uh, it's given to you by society. You know, there are lots of rules being put in place, but in the end, you're allowed to do it as long as you abide by the rules and you actually think about the implicate, not, not to the letter, it's beyond that. You actually think about what you're doing to society. Go back and think about the purpose, because in the end, uh, business has to be the servant of society, and it is providing uh, the motor power for advancement everywhere, Re real advancement. The moment I think people begin to think that business is not doing that, uh, then I think we have a problem. It means that uh, economic activity reduces uh, and people's future is heavily damaged. You, you can see that in, in my book, I talk about some both amusing and rather tragic uh, historical examples of, of both abuses and the reaction to them and the overreaction uh, which caused world problems. Just to open up for questions in one second, I'll just ask one question and then we have the first one from the floor there. Um, just wanted to connect your two big decisions. Um, so you also decided to come out as a gay in 2007. Um, and following that, you also wrote a book on the glass closet. Where do you see the role of business in engaging on societal, social topics? So uh, I... Um I, I was actually outed in 2007 I, yeah. I, uh, because I got into a mess. And I'm, a, let's say, a child. I was born in the late 40s. And while I was growing up, it was not only illegal to do something about being gay, it was regarded as unacceptable. And so I spent my life uh, deciding at that. My, my mother instantly gave me some, she was an Auschwitz survivor. And she said, remember, never trust anyone with a secret because they'll use it against you. And always remember, minorities are always hurt by the majority when the going gets tough. The majority always goes back and hurts the minority. And, and these lessons kept me in the closet for a very long time. And I had two very complicated lives as a result of it. It was fun while I was young. I was like being James Bond, you know. One. Uh, it was rather tragic as I was getting older. So I, I think uh, it's very important that leaders are role models. And the, the most important point about coming out is it's role modeling being yourself. Because you know, when you're gay, you can hide it away. You can't hide away being a, a woman or a man. Uh, you can't hide away being white or non-white. All these sorts of things you can't hide away. You can hide this away, and it really gnaws away against uh, your leadership. I think role modeling, therefore, is critical, uh, as certainly at the top of a company, 
and demonstrating where those role models are and making them visible so that people feel, rather than being lectured to, saying, you know, it's really good to come out, you can, they say, well, that's very interesting, but who succeeded? You can say, well, she succeeded, he succeeded. Uh, and that makes all the difference. So that's why this is really important. I'm sad in some ways that in the S&P 500, there is only one openly gay CEO. And I think using very broad and naive statistics that let's say 5% of the population is gay, we should have 25 CEOs who are openly gay. So either there's a problem in gay people getting advancement in companies, and that may be the case, they may be holding back because they're very concerned or may not be using all their brain because they're using half of it to hide away who they are. Corporations may be very conservative and not promote people, or actually there may just be a lot of people in the closet. And we may just have 24 CEOs who are in the closet who won't come out. I hope that's not the case, but I just hope there are more role models because it will be important for the world. Thank you, I couldn't agree more. Please, first question from floor. Uh, Lord Brown, lovely to see you again. Um, Joe Confino at the Huffington Post. Um, on the basis that we're being bold this morning, um, you talked about when you talked about BP sort of moving towards renewable energy, how all the oil exec CEOs came to see you to see you of right of mind. And then you talked today about seven European and Middle Eastern com uh, oil and gas companies coming together, no American ones. So I just want to say, if you woke up tomorrow morning and you found yourself as the CEO of ExxonMobil right now, and being bold in your answer and not avoiding the question, um, <laughs> as you did to me a couple of years ago in Scandinavia, um, if things, things, since things have moved on, what would you do as CEO of ExxonMobil right now in terms of bringing this your, everything you're saying into actually changing that company and what it would do, how it would do it, and actually what decisions it would make differently now at the very top. Thank you. It's a very long question. It has a very simple answer. You know, in order to be uh, authentic, you have to be consistent. So I'd be consistent. I would do exactly what I did with BP. But it's a hypothetical question. And so, but all other things being equal, you know, if you move... Uh, Person, I would try and do everything I did with BP. Thank you. We have actually a question here on. Uh... <laughs> it's. Uh, I think it's a consistent answer. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, so we have Anna Tonkel who asks: In our current state of disruption, who are the primary stakeholders that business must engage? Well, I, I think there are really, let's think first of employees, the team internally, as the single most important stakeholder. So clearly they have to be engaged. And in a time of great disruption, you really do have to engage the internal team in a, in a very, very big way. Uh, because they're the people that will get you through a state of disruption. Uh, so that's the first. The second, I think it depends on, you know, who what sort of business you're in. It would be easy and glib to say, time of disruption, you need to make sure your alignment with the government is good, but that's not necessarily the case in, in different businesses. So I think it's about just assessing your world and finding out just exactly who are the best, who are the most important people to engage with, and that will keep changing over time. It really will keep changing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question right here. Ellen Weinreb with Weinreb Group Sustainability Recruiting. Um, I was in the room at Yale in 97, 98 when you made one of your um, announcements and I think it impacted a lot of people in the room and there have been repercussions professionally for people um, as a result of that. I, my question is, I think, so thank you for that. Um, the question is, I see a lot of parallel similarities um, to your story and David Crane at NRG. And I was wondering if you had either um, you've thought, um, either advice or uh, com contrast or compare your situation or how the situation might be different today versus then. I don't really know a lot about the details of NRG. 
but I do think that the companies are slightly different and probably therefore one has to take a different approach. B BP had a huge legacy and, and so forth and it was pretty clear that we had to move the legacy forward. Uh, so, but it did have a very secure base to go with. I think this is quite difficult to do in a company that is probably early on in changing itself. You have to be careful not to change so quickly that you lose everyone behind you. So for example, at BP, one of the things I had to do was to align the board of directors. Most boards of directors are genuinely cautious. Uh, they like to understand what they do, if they're any good. They've got to understand what they do. Uh, and it takes time to align them. And I had, and I found, as you always do, a great ally. So there was a great scientist on the board who was, uh, used to be Mrs. Thatcher's chief scientific advisor. And to have been the advisor of Mrs. Thatcher, who was the scientist herself, you had to be very good, because otherwise she would have just dismissed you. And he was someone you just didn't dismiss. And he was convinced that this was the right course of action. So he and I walked around the rest of the board saying, actually, you can't ignore this, you need to do something about it. So you've got to align the important decision makers before you go forward, otherwise you go forward into a black hole. I'll just take one more question. There's, out there. There's all the way back to the right. We can get a mic down there. Oh, it's on its way. Uh, good morning, and um, hi, good morning. My name's Anya, I'm from GreenViz, and thank you very much for your keynote. It was really uh, wonderful and also personally impactful. Um, my question is about your comment on how businesses and business leaders need to listen to all aspects of society in order to make decisions. Um, in order to do that, especially in today's media climate, there's always something new. There's so many things to pay attention to, all of which are very important um, and ca can cause social repercussions for businesses. Um, do companies need to create new roles, like advisory roles, for CEOs to understand um, what people and young people are, are doing and um, you know, with movements like Black Lives Matter, movements like the Standing Rock um, protests, uh, in order to make sure that CEOs are actually listening and not just filtering through their own, um, their own prism of what's happening? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, one of the things is that there are so many things going on, there's so many people to listen to, that you have to exercise judgment in working out which pieces have lasting significance and what you're going to rely upon. Now, I think hopefully when you've got to the head of a company or a country or something, you've had some experience at trying to figure out what's right and wrong and what's good and bad. But you need help. Uh, and so you do need advisors. Uh, and the advisors need to be r relative to the importance of the day. You know, what's important. So for example, in BP, I decided I would build a, an advisory panel uh, for uh, certain aspects, so science, uh, geopolitics, uh, uh, changes in demography, and we had extraordinary people come and advise. And more importantly, I think you need to let a very large number of executives, and in BP's case in my time, 40 executives, go through master classes with truly great people who have listened and thought. So I, at one stage I had Nelson Mandela come and talk to people about inclusion and actually about truth. A and I had uh, Henry Kissinger come and talk about linkage. Uh, you know, and, and how do you think about things? How do you know when you move one thing, not something else is shifting? And how do you keep all those balls in the air at once? So I think it's really important because companies do have a habit of being in a bubble. Uh, and they can create a bubble, and then they make decisions that really don't work because they're all convinced that they do work. You know, maybe they're 
don't have too much diversity on the management. They've maybe half of them been to the same university. They live in a town which isn't very big. I'm describing Volkswagen at this point. Uh, you know, and so it's not uncommon. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I have many interests in, in companies, mostly in the renewable energy business and things like that, where they are in small places. And you have to just remind people that there's a great world outside and they need to get out and, and, and see people and you need to help them not create their own truth that isn't actually the truth. So thank you for that. And I think on that note, uh, I'd invite all of you to go out and radically engage outside, get out of your bubble, maybe even get a bit of fresh air and talk to other people. Um, so please join me in thanking Lord Brown for his wonderful presentation. <laughs>